I always knew magic was real, and I never cared who thought I was crazy. School was not my thing. I didn't see a point in learning very specific micro tasks that would only apply to a select few professions instead of everywhere. And in Sunday school, there was always a little voice in my head saying, I don't know if that's true, whenever the lady with glasses and white Rod Stewart hair would start talking. One time, in front of the whole class, verbally, I made a correspondence between the Bible and He-Man to better understand a few verses of God's Word. And I vividly remember her eye twitching as she said, All right, well, if you're going to be a wise guy, and flipped my chair around. I'm sharing these anecdotes because I think it's very likely that many of you who are watching this video have felt the same way at some point in your life. Knowing who you are deep in your soul, despite everything around you constantly trying to convince you otherwise. I spent so many years just wishing something would confirm my mind, confirm what I knew was true. There was substance behind the superstitions of the occult, and I wanted to explore what magic with a K really was, but most people think magic is either fiction or devil worship. So in my mind, I was alone and lost. This week, I read a bunch of comments that reminded me of some of the questions I had and some of the topics I wanted to unpack when I was first starting out. So in this video, I'm answering those questions by first giving you the most important thing, and that is you are not alone. Every question you have, someone has already asked it. Every rabbit hole you go down, someone has gone down it even further. Every experience you have can be explained. And if you're one of those people disinterested in the everyday things that society hounds you to be interested in, well, I think you're in a really good place. Welcome to Mage Space. Let's explore. In reference to the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram, Trask and Douglas Carducci dropped two related comments. Both of you respectfully made mention of how certain practices I teach may be too powerful or perhaps even dangerous for beginners or people who are half-heartedly walking this path. And I agree, hexagram rituals, for example, are best when a practitioner has spent several months aligning their energies with pentagram and middle pillar groundwork. Hexagram rituals heighten emotions, and for those who are traveling through an unstable season, heightened emotions could very well be a negative thing. Having said that, I don't necessarily view dramatic emotional pendulum swings as dangerous or even particularly destructive. So for rituals that I believe are on the more mild danger scale, I generally stay away from warnings because warnings can plant seeds of fear. And when you perform rituals from a place of fear or anxiety, it then becomes much more likely that a negative result will occur. The warning becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are uneasy about a new practice and concerned about what might happen if you work with hexagrams, I do suggest holding off until you feel more calm and confident in your abilities. But it sounds like the both of you are well beyond that stage and are just looking out for others. Douglas said, 93, once again, phenomenal images and instructional value with spot on verbiages and video. I would warn that some of the practices you're teaching, although not so much this one, should not be used half-heartedly and by the profane curiosity seekers. Only with enlightened intentions and clean hearts should people be doing this kind of magic. As if certain rituals are done wrong, the karma backlog is tenfold. But once again, great work, brother. Love is the law, love under will. Thank you for the kind words, Douglas, and thank you for bringing this up. And Trask2435 said, your descriptions are impeccable. I applaud your attention to detail. Fantastic production value. My only criticism is maybe a warning for normies out there that don't understand this technology. If they're not ready for what energy is in store for them and do these rituals while unbalanced, there is quite the boot camp which awaits to put you in alignment. However, this might be the ticket to help solidify more beneficial timelines. Thank you, Trask. I deeply 
appreciate your kind words and thank you for openly expressing your heart. There is truth in both of these comments. Kindly direct your attention to Trask's last two sentences as they sum up my mentality precisely. I am a more is better, yes, and sort of a creature. I think growth is messy, and I think boot camps are necessary if you're a high energy person. The first time I invoked angels, I had no idea what I was doing. I invoked the 12 zodiacal angels with no prep work, and you're not supposed to do that. What happened? I became overwhelmed with rage for the entire day. Later, I had to drive somewhere, and I was so blinded by emotion that I didn't notice my car was running on empty. I slowly rolled to a stop shortly thereafter and became even more angry. Much later that night, when I finally got home, I sat on the grass and meditated under the moon. Meditating under the moon balanced the rage I was feeling, and when I woke up the next morning, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that magic was real. The burst of unbalanced rage, although a result of incorrectly performed magic, woke me up, which was both painful and necessary. Transmutation always comes with fire. Fire is an energy within every human, and feeling the fire of a new spiritual practice isn't a negative thing. It's a sign of transformation. Now, whether you want to work with this fire or take a step back and cool off, that's entirely up to you. And on the topic of fire, I'll loop in a few more questions as they are also related. Andrew Craig, 4237, in reference to the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram, asked, Do you find any personal benefits doing this? I got really angry when I did it regularly. Yes, I do find personal benefits in doing this regularly, which I will loop back around to in a few moments, but first, anger. Yup, that can happen. Now, is this anger bad? I don't know, you tell me. The lesser hexagram rituals bridge you into the astral realm where your emotional energies live. And lesser hexagram rituals feel different than lesser pentagram rituals because the energies you're working with are more emotional and more dramatic. Although the lesser hexagram rituals work with the elemental energy of the cosmos, the classic hexagram does represent planetary energy. Pentagram, elemental. Hexagram, planetary. You feeling angry is neither good nor evil, and the emotion of anger is no less spiritual than the emotion of bliss. It's just energy. Energy is power, and the practical life benefits of this power will be revealed to you through the transmutation of this anger. The lesser ritual of the hexagram is an emotional exercise. And if an emotional exercise makes you angry, it could indicate an imbalance of fire to water in your energy. In this case, increasing your work with the water element could be a very beneficial thing. This anger could also indicate that you've been fire deficient for quite some time. Fire is finally waking up in your system, and you're not entirely sure how to express the fire churning through your energy right now. Anxiety and anger are close cousins to excitement. Perhaps a subtle redirection is in order. Normal Films 7953 followed Andrew Craig's fire with, I got angry all night at work, so I stopped doing it. Boom, I respect that decision. This communicates a person who's in tune with their energy. This guy knows when to ease in and out of the right practices for him at the right times in his life. A great example of listening to your energy and being self aware. The lesser ritual of the hexagram became non-beneficial for normal films to do every day, so he backed off. If you listen to your body and regularly check in with your nervous system, magic shouldn't scare you. Stopping a particular practice for a few days, a week, whatever, in most cases, for the rituals that are currently on my channel, that's all it really takes to cool off and get yourself out of that danger zone. None of the ceremonies I currently have on this channel come with major or secret side effects. Your emotions may feel raw for a few days, but no crack will be released into the wild. So, if you experience anger from some of these practices, reflect on this. Is the anger causing you to lash out at other people? Is it blinding you at work and leading you to do things that could get you fired? If so, 
make your decision. Now, if you are in a season, however, where you actively want to work on these things and are in a safe place in life to do so, then I'd encourage you to work with that fire in your energy. If you can take the heat and transmute that fire into a work of life art that you then epically weave into your journey. I was born angry. Transmuting my fire into something greater is a daily pleasure, and through this pleasure, I grow. Anger is a tool. Everything is a tool. Next, we have at Seth Rogen lookalike. If I could suggest a video, I would ask for a video that outlines when and how many times you do each of these rituals, including Middle Pillar, Kabbalistic Cross, LBRP, LIRP, LVX, hexagram, assuming that we now know them. Unfortunately, this isn't really talked about in Eccles' books. I don't really remember if he talks about how often and when other than to do the LIRP in the morning and the LBRP at night. That's really what I want to know. I just want to know when to do them all and how to create a ceremony that might take an hour each day. I'm so glad you asked this. Here's what I do. I bookend all my primary rituals with either Kabbalistic crosses or LVXs. My morning routine opens with the Kabbalistic cross, followed by the lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram, and then the Kabbalistic cross. Next, I go into the LVX ritual, followed by the lesser invoking ritual of the hexagram, and then the LVX ritual. After that, I do the Rose Cross ritual, followed by the LVX again. Once the divine light has finished descending upon me, I'll go right into the middle pillar, followed by thank you mantras and daily intentions. I then close the routine and seal my aura with the Kabbalistic Cross. My night routine is very similar to my morning routine, only I replace the invokings with banishings. Furthermore, I only do the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram three to four times a week and not every day. Reason being, I create art all the time and I am constantly channeling emotional planetary energy into my work. When I get a planet spinning in a ball rolling, I don't want to nuke the thing before it's halfway there, so I generally do the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram at the end of an art day and when I would like a blank canvas the next morning. This twice daily routine is a morning and evening routine that will continuously churn your transformational fire. This routine is building the light body. If you do this every day for a year, you will be blown away by your energy upgrades and the depth at which you understand these esoteric concepts. Reading and studying the occult gives you knowledge, but practicing these occult rituals is what gives you the wisdom. That's when the downloads of information start flooding into your mind, the packed thought forms, the highly concentrated blocks of information that hit you in ceremony and go If you do this morning and evening routine every day for just a few weeks, you will likely start receiving some light codes. If you do this morning and evening routine every day for a year, you will surely receive many light codes. If you're present and focused, you can get through both the morning and evening routines in about 30 minutes, making your daily practice a solid hour. You can also make some modifications. I don't always do a full Kabbalistic cross or LVX every time I perform these rituals. They open and close so many of these ceremonies that it starts to feel a bit redundant at times. I do my first Kabbalistic cross and LVX ritual in full, always, and then sometimes I'll condense the other ones that I perform throughout the rest of this routine. Shortening hexagram and pentagram rituals by vibrating the divine names while drawing the sacred shapes instead of after is also an option. So there's your hour a day routine. Now I also have a middle of the day routine, and my middle of the day routine is where I focus on expanding my practices. Right now I'm doing the supreme invoking ritual of the pentagram and greater invoking rituals of the pentagram while working with tree of life and zodiacal angels. I am close to memorizing the 72 names of the Shem Hamef Orash. 
Once I have, I shall perform the Shem operation. Additionally, I have also been doing a greater invoking hexagram ritual, working with specific planets. I chose to make magic a huge part of my life, and practicing is a top priority. Not everyone wants to practice magic this much, and that's perfectly fine because you'll still see major improvements with just 15 to 30 minutes a day. And on this note, I would like Mage Space to be my day job. If you're getting value from my work, kindly like this video and share it with others so this information travels farther and reaches more people. 15 to 30 minutes a day will do wonders for your energy. A good routine for this timeline is morning, Kabbalistic cross, lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram, Kabbalistic cross, middle pillar, Kabbalistic cross. Evening, Kabbalistic Cross, Lesser Banishing, Ritual of the Pentagram, Kabbalistic Cross, LVX, Rose Cross, LVX. Now as for the Lesser Hexagram Ritual, not everyone finds benefit in doing this one every day. There are beneficial things happening in your energy body, whether you're conscious of them or not, but Hexagram Banishing and Invoking every day is often a bit much for a person's energy, especially during the first year of practice. So, if you're short on time and feel that the hexagram ritual is kind of heavy, try doing one hexagram ritual every day or every other day, including it either in your morning or evening routine. If you do it in the morning, invoke. And if you do it in the evening, banish. Do it after your pentagram ritual and bookend it with LVX rituals. If you're feeling unbalanced in any way, make sure to perform the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram before working with hexagrams. Some say always do the banishing pentagram ritual before any hexagram ritual. And some go on further to say always do the banishing hexagram ritual before the invoking hexagram ritual. I agree with this process when you are still learning these ceremonies and reflecting on how they're affecting you. Once you understand them and can competently execute the full process, I then think it's beneficial to find a routine flow that works best for you and that you can keep up with on a consistent basis. Me personally, I don't do banishing rituals in the morning before I do my invoking rituals. I start my day with invocation only. Looping back finally to the personal benefits of the lesser hexagram ritual, I personally experienced more emotions, a greater depth of feeling in all areas of life, and a heightened awareness to the outer world. Things started coming to me more instead of me having to go to them as much. I grew better at seeing the whole chessboard. With pentagrams, I was flying just above the trees. With lesser hexagrams, I was flying above the clouds. Macrocosmic alignment elevates our view and expands our awareness. All these benefits I just mentioned though, turn a bit negative when I'm in an unbalanced state. If I'm angry and I heighten my emotions while expanding my view, sometimes I just find more things to be angry about. Awareness is a double-edged sword when we're not balanced. I approach this ritual as a power amplifier. I feel balanced and healthy a large majority of the time. So when I amplify my power, it's generally more light, more divine spark, it's more positive emotions. But if I'm in an unbalanced state, which I occasionally am, and then I amplify my power, I may turn a bit dragon-like for a few hours, which again isn't bad when transmuted into something greater. When I do the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram too much, I feel emotionally drained, sad even. When I do the lesser invoking ritual of the hexagram too much, I feel emotionally overstimulated and angry. Those are the lesser hexagrams, everyone. Take this information and do as thou wilt with it. Next, this channel overall has been a warm and expanding presence in my life at this time. Thank you so much for this work. It is my absolute pleasure. Thank you. As a request, your take on the sacred circle and whether or not drawing one is necessary for this kind of work. How a beginner might start with the circle in this ritual versus the adept. 
Okay, the sacred circle, the white light we draw around ourselves during these rituals. The white light that connects all the sacred shapes. I'll answer this by saying that you don't need to do anything. Just realizing you are one with God and that all is one gives you the keys to the kingdom. If you fully embody this, you don't need magic because you are magic. But right now, your amnesia is blocking you from realizing your gnosis. So you must remind yourself of who you are over and over and over again until every layer of your consciousness remembers. The sacred circle is in you and you have been drawing it since the beginning of time and into infinity. Until you remember this, it is necessary to draw it, if not physically, then visualized in your mind, and it is necessary to follow the directions of these rituals as closely as possible until you've mastered all the steps. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, because once you've mastered the wheel that has already been invented, you will then have all of eternity to invent new shapes. How a beginner might start with the circle in this ritual versus the adept. Beginners and adepts alike perform the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. In some circles, it is known as the philosopher's stone of ceremonial magic. If you are a beginner, I suggest practicing the sacred circle while practicing the LBRP. If you become adept at the LBRP, you will then have the skill set to learn all the other rituals. Yes, the LBRP takes a fair amount of time and effort to even learn, let alone competently practice and there are many steps that may be overwhelming for beginners. I'd encourage you to push yourself here. It's well worth the effort, and it's never been easier to learn the LBRP because I made a guided video for it. I learned this ritual by reading it and then doing it myself. Discovering the visuals in my own head. The images you see on your screen are the images in my mind when I perform this ritual. Use them and keep drawing your sacred circle until the sacred circle is spinning around you automatically at all times. If the LBRP and pentagrams are a bit much right now, try box breathing while inhaling white light making a sword mudra, and draw a simple circle of white light around you, stopping at each cardinal direction and breathing as you continue to draw. Great, well I'm almost done answering your question, but before I do fully, I'm looping in the next comment as it shares a common thread I wish to highlight. JGJ2648, have you any more in-depth videos of cleansing the aura through the use of the LBRP on its uses and benefits, especially of strengthening us to outside influences or attacks, and anything else you can think of? Yes, the LBRP works on the sphere of Malkuth and on the elemental energy within your energy body. This energy flows through you like a webbed net. This net is an energy rendering that immediately precedes the manifestation of your cells, organs, guts, bones, and all other physical workings and movements. The LBRP reinforces this net and makes this net more powerful. It gives your net strength and elasticity, which shields your body from energy attacks. If you're an emotional person and someone throws a negative emotion your way, it is very easy to feel this toxicity within the body. And when that happens, it creates resistance in your life. The way you live, breathe, and move is more subject to the whims of every fleeting emotional current that travels into your auric field. When you're like this, things like a broken heart make it difficult to do your job or to enjoy the things you would normally enjoy. But if your physical energy web is strong and resilient, the brunt of that negative attack bounces off in a sort of trampoline-like motion and less of that toxicity is absorbed into your body. Now here's the thing, you may very well still feel the emotions of a negative attack, but these negative emotions won't affect your living, breathing, and moving as much physically. You'll still feel the broken heart, but you will have the ability to go about your day gracefully while properly performing your tasks. The emotional part of your energy body is on Yasad and higher, whereas your web is on Malkuth. So it's not a full emotional guard because your web of elemental energy is on a different plane than your emotions. But since all layers of consciousness are interconnected and woven together, and because the health of your physical body 
has a lot to do with the health of your emotional body. Strengthening your elemental energy has a profound effect on your emotional resilience. Energy is all about spirals and snowballs. If you go to work with a broken heart, but you kill it at your day job that day, that's gonna nudge you a few clicks back towards the light. Little wins keep the fires of life motivation churning inside you. If you're feeling depressed, one of the best things you can do is go for a run. Cardio doesn't work with your emotions directly, but the chemicals produced in your brain from cardio evoke a chain reaction of chemicals that naturally and automatically elevate your emotions. In this same way, the LBRP protects us from energy vampires, toxic environments, and all the negative energy shrapnel that comes our way in this wonderful era of smartphones. Magic works on you through subconscious suggestion and quantum entanglement. Subconscious suggestion is a scientifically proven thing, and we understand the particulars of the science that gives magic its power. Quantum entanglement is a scientific principle, but there's still a lot of debate in the scientific community as to how it all works. Although these practices are believed to work in part due to the principle of quantum entanglement, and although we see people cause manifestations that seem to be linked with quantum entanglement, esoteric information is not always airtight. And it's important to differentiate theories that are very likely true due to correspondences and experiential evidence and scientific fact. Right now, I'm going to give you my esoteric understanding of quantum entanglement. Soon, I'll make a scientific video on quantum entanglement when I've hashed out a few more concepts that would be irresponsible for me to speak on now. The esoteric view I align with is the whole universe started as a singularity. The Big Bang was let there be light. The light expanded and continuously created as it expanded, going in an infinite number of directions and creating multitudes of characters, concepts, and materials. So divine source is everything, and everything is divine source. That singularity chose to become everything and experience everything, not as the macrocosm, but as the microcosm. In order to experience the microcosm, the human condition, one must have a certain amnesia about their previous high and mighty God status in order to experience the authentic human condition. Or they wouldn't be authentically experiencing human frailty, which is scary, dangerous, and beautiful. I wonder what it's like to be a redwood tree that just stands still and grows taller and taller for hundreds and hundreds of years. Hmm, I think I'll be that for a while. And so the all chose to forget it was the all and chose to become a redwood tree. The all chose to become you, to become Hermes Trismegistus, to become Jesus, to become Ra, to become Isis, to become Osiris, to become all the different stars, planets, elements, shapes, codes, and light languages of the universe. Whether you remember this or not, all these things are somewhere in you. They are rooted in the deep recesses of your consciousness, and your door to all this information lives in your subconscious mind. By drawing pentagrams in front of you and around you over and over and over again, you are printing your elemental shape, your elemental stance in this universe onto your subconscious mind. When you perform the Kabbalistic cross, you are anchoring yourself to the four cardinal directions, embedding those images, sounds, and movements into your subconscious mind. The sacred circle, visualizing this, and even better physically drawing it in the air while you're visualizing this, reminds your subconscious mind that you are Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This circle is within you and around you at all times. Now, the more you do these rituals, the more you will remember who you are and the more you will naturally start thinking and moving like the God you are in your everyday life. Shapes, cardinal direction anchors, evoking angels, all these things are padding you with spiritual armor. They are raising the deflector shields on your spacecraft. The rituals I just mentioned are only a minuscule fraction of the many avenues of divinity we tap into on this journey. Working with angels or angles of light is working on specific areas of your mind. 
Corresponding with how we as humans build muscle mass, it's important to work our main muscles, but it is equally important to work our smaller, supporting muscles surrounding our main muscles. This is angel magic, and we see greater energy upgrades when we have worked through the more finer, subtler details of our consciousness. Because our door to the divine is in the subconscious mind, repetition is everything. When you practice magic daily, it just starts to stick. If you practice the LBRP every day for a year, your subconscious mind will be full of magic. The more you do this ritual, the stronger your elemental energy will be. And if some of those toxins do seep into your aura, you will then bounce back from that impact much faster. And finally, we're talking about shrooms. Brian Evans, how do you feel about mushrooms on the spiritual path? I'm not advocating any illegal sourcing or use of any substance, but I do think medicines like mushrooms are friends on the spiritual path. They are friends that only become problematic if you make them your gods. Understand, you do also have the power to get there without drugs. With intense practice, you will be able to soberly self-induce psychedelic experiences comparable to your experiences on mushrooms and other psychotropic and hallucinogenic substances. Psilocybin can be particularly useful for people who have never had a spiritual experience before. A person who can't even conceive a spiritual experience won't have the motivation to do the mind work that would eventually allow them to get there naturally. A medicinal trip shows you what's possible. Once you see what's possible, you now know what you're looking for and it's easier to do the work. Mushrooms are also great for spiritual adepts looking to expand their ceremonies and delve even deeper into their minds. Psilocybin makes everything more vivid and intense, so if you use it with intention in your rituals, you will often see greater benefits than when practicing without. The thing about mushrooms also, as soon as you take them, you are instantly more psychic for however long they're in your system. I know more about magic than I do about mushrooms at this stage on my journey, so I won't go too much further here, but yes, I feel mushrooms and other natural medicines are friends on the spiritual path when taken with the right intentions. And there you have it. I hope I answered your questions well. If so, drop me a comment, let me know, and feel free to ask more because I like doing this. This is fun.